The Intersection will be back with new episodes from Googleville in the new year. In the meantime, we've got something special to tide you over. So grab a hot cocoa or some eggnog, spike it with something naughty, and settle in for a journey back in time to the holiday season of a simpler year, 2013. Back then, the Bay Area had pretty much rebounded from the Great Recession, and the word on a lot of curled lips was hypergentrification. Full disclosure, I was still pretty fresh to audio, but I knew I wanted to chronicle our changing city. So my brilliant editor at KALW, Ben Trefney, challenged me to produce a story about the edge of gentrification. You know the kind of place. It's got an auto body shop, a no-frills corner store, maybe a dive bar, and wait, what's that? A new wine bar attached to a gourmet cheesery? I looked at a bunch of neighborhoods like this as I searched for the border, but each time a little research uncovered rents that had already soared and work permits for luxury lofts. Then one day, I kept driving, beyond Dogpatch, past an industrial park, to a neighborhood with a sketchy reputation, Bayview Hunters Point. I spotted a holiday crafts bazaar on an open lot across from a KFC Taco Bell, and I pulled over. Then I saw it, a gorgeously designed banner hanging from a chain link fence with the logo of the event sponsor. That's right, Etsy. This is the story of that corner, Third and Gerald, told by an earlier draft of me. I hope you enjoy it. When I left San Francisco back in 98, the first tech boom was just taking hold. The area here, right outside AT&T Park at the corner of Third and King, it was pretty much deserted, except for a few dance clubs. When I came back a few years later, everything was different. Instead of old warehouses and abandoned lots, this was a whole new neighborhood called South Beach. Today, the transformation that began with the ballpark is accelerating south along 3rd Street, right along the T-Train line. First stop, Mission Bay. There are two brand new luxury developments, plans for a high-end hotel. Oh, and the Golden State Warriors, they just bought a big plot of land here to build their new arena. Let's keep going south. There's a new UCSF hospital rising at 16th and 3rd. Between here and 24th, more than a thousand apartments with street level bars, restaurants, and retail are somewhere between breaking ground and people moving in. And then there's nothing. Just like South Beach back in the day. Industrial warehouses, auto body shops, truck routes, few people, no homes. Finally, we reached the Bayview District, 3rd and Gerald, an intersection with one foot in the past and one in the future. On one side, there's a combination KFC Taco Bell and an old Baptist church. On the other, there's the new All Good Pizza and a nonprofit co-founded by Steve Jobs' widow, Loreen Powell Jobs. This is what I've been searching for, a place just barely ahead of the tide of development. I want to talk with people working and living in the middle of this transition. We'll start with the church. We're just in time for Sunday service. This is where I meet longtime parishioner Diana Morton. Morning, everyone. I am Diana. We are here at St. John Missionary Baptist Church. Lord, we're going on our 66th year, and each and every Sunday we came here to praise your name, month after month, and year after year, Lord, and we want to say thank you, Lord. I've been going here since 50, probably 58. We didn't have a car. So we used to walk here every Sunday. Like all kids, I hated Sunday mornings because I had to get up (laughs) early (laughs) to be at Sunday school for 9 o'clock. We went to Sunday school, 11 o'clock service, 3 o'clock service, 6 o'clock service, and 7 o'clock service. So it was an all-day thing. You know, we had, of course, we had breaks in the middle for food and there used to be a restaurant. We called it the jute joint because it had a jukebox. Now you're moving on up. The kids of the church used to tip off there in between Sunday school and church. And we used to play music and dance. And the older people in the church would notice most of their teenagers was gone. They found us <laughs> and they marched us back. Oh, your fancy clothes. 
back then, the Kentucky Fried Chicken across the street, that wasn't there. That was just a lot. There was a vacant lot, and then there was this little building. That's where we used to have junior church. In my teens, I loved being here. It was exciting. Everybody was really, really dressed up. And somebody would start a song over here or a song of breakout over there, and it was just like, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. Father. That's how the congregation would respond with what this person just led with. And after he finishes his part, it says somebody else may start out with a song. And then somebody would shout. And fall all over the place and we'd kind of be waiting to see who was going to shout next. It was just exciting. Bayview, it's changed a lot. Didn't have so many liquor stores on third back then. And what I remember in the 60s, they wanted to put another liquor store and our pastor said we need to march on City Hall because it's not a good thing for our people. It's going to bring the neighborhood down. More alcohol, more alcoholics, more people hanging out, more crime. That was the fear. And I do believe that they were right. Now, we don't have night service at all anymore. Because of so much violence in the neighborhood, people are afraid to come out at night. Thank the Lord, so far this month we're okay, but coming in this year, we had a lot of funerals. Seemed like one every week. We've had some funerals here for kids that's been killed out there. Um, I believe the role of the church is to try to reach those people that you'll never see until there's another funeral. You'll never see them, you know? Lord, we ask that you have mercy this morning. And then, Heavenly Father, we, we ask that you touch those that are on the street corners this morning, those behind prison walls, for we all have family members and friends that are still in darkness. We ask that you have mercy this morning. The congregation has gotten much, much smaller. Honestly, because things are better for black people. Back in our day, when, when my parents' day, times were hard. You know, certain areas you could not move into because you weren't allowed. So people were thankful for every single thing that they got because they knew it was by the grace of God because everything else seemed to be against them. Now people think that they can get things better on their own. Their need for God seems to be has diminished because they things are either so good or they're so bad that they're hopeless and they don't think that there's no hope to be found in church. And then there are more churches. <laughs> there's a church on every corner. Whereas there was maybe two churches splitting the neighborhood, you've got 50 churches now. So every one of them has a few people. I can have 50 members, but if I'm doing my best, I got a mega church. Y'all ain't going to help me here. Because how many members at my church don't denote how close I am to God? God blesses me on my ability to handle what he gave me. Yes, yes. The neighborhood is changing, and this is not, this is not a black area anymore. There are more 
of everybody living in Bayview now. There's Orientals, there's Hispanics. Back in the day, this was a black church. It's an all-black church pretty much still because they're not coming to this church because they're thinking that's a black church. But there's no race requirement. <laughs> We're mostly black, but that don't mean you can't come. <laughs> Christ loves you and so do we. <laughs> Come back next Sunday. Bring a friend. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. You too. Since 1970, the demographics of Bayview Hunters Point have changed a lot. There are only half as many African Americans now, but there are four times as many Latinos and seven times as many Asian Americans. There's also a small but noticeable increase of white residents. Now, while those numbers don't necessarily bode well for an historically black church like St. John's, they're just fine for other businesses in the area. Across 3rd Street, the KFC Taco Bell is having no problem attracting a diverse crowd. It's by far the most active corner of the intersection. There's a steady stream of cars waiting for the drive through and inside, the line is 15 deep. It's the height of the daily happier hour, when grillers and medium drinks are just a dollar. The cashiers can't seem to serve them up quickly enough. Chicken is always popular. I mean, that's the number one thing. But now we just got this um, double XL um, nacho bel grande came out, and a lot of people was getting that as well. My name is Nikisha McDowell. I've been working for KFC about a year now. Never thought I would work at KFC. So it's I'm the lead cashier right now. I'm doing training. I also am a case manager employment special for city and county, and then I do here for my little part time. I was born and raised in San Francisco. Till I was like 10, I lived over here in Bayview Hunters Point. I used to stay on Gerald, uh, right up the street. Right now, I'm inside, like over by the project area, by more low income housing or Section 8 housing. A lot of people come to this KFC. The construction workers, people that work at these little businesses, the people that work at the barbershop, families. Um, that lady, she just starts sitting here. She's just hanging out. See, we get that a lot. <coughs> Most of the um, people that hang out, they're either panhandling, trying to get changed, or some of them just sitting here until nighttime. But we don't care about people just sitting there. Probably better if they sit there than sit on the street. I'm about to be like Madea in a minute. <laughs> What's taking them so long? I apologize. It's so backed up back here. I told her I owe her an apology. Probably half of the staff lives in the neighborhood. So I think that's why they hired them because for our customers that come in, they are sometimes difficult to deal with. Like some of them um, don't have enough money. Some of them get discouraged about the price. Some of them get upset because we're not rushing for them. Some of them we know from way back when. Hey, charge him for back. <laughs> he got, he got, I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare. Hey, I wouldn't <laughs> dare. I'm telling you though. It was fun growing up around this neighborhood because most of everybody that grew up around this neighborhood went to the same school. My mom knew their mom, aunties knew their aunties, our cousins move over here. It was fun. It was kind of scary a little bit because of um, so much drug transactions going on and people gang banging. There used to be a lot of people hanging out on KFC and a lot of people died on that next block over and I lost my child's father on that block. He got murdered on, it's called Kirkwood, and he got murdered. He was in some gang brutality thing, and he was chased down from Palu all the way to Kirkwood, and that's where he laid, and he was um, dead at arrival. And the projects, it's still the same. It's still um, gang banging, shooting going on, but I just think it decreased because of the people that were really 
doing it and provoking other people to do it is either locked up or dead. Right now, with everybody all gone or in jail, it's been really quiet on this area. I think it's, it's much, much better. Um, they're starting to decorate it more, um, put a lot of more color in it, my, a lot of more palm trees. The palm trees wasn't there. The tea tray wasn't here. All good pizza, they just built that right there. It used to be just nothing right there. So yeah, it's got better. I see a lot of tourists over here too. That's new. Um, the minority part is new as well too because I'm seeing a lot of different um, variety of people than just seeing blacks. But KFC stayed the same. <laughs> it hasn't changed. In five years, I think it's going to be more condos and less black people in this area because we have a couple of condos right there and they're not low income. So, and I think all good pizza is going to get teared down and they're going to put apartment complexes right there. Just like they did on Palu. Knowing that this is a low income area, I think we're always going to have low income. But if, if they keep bringing these condos in here, I'm going to have to move sometime, somehow. Next to line, please. Most weekdays around 4 o'clock, a group of teens take their KFC to go and head to the other side of Gerald Avenue. They're students at College Track, an after-school program that helps kids in under-resourced communities prepare for and complete college. The nonprofit, which was co-founded by Steve Jobs' widow, Laureen Powell Jobs, has sites in five other cities. In 2012, College Track moved its Bayview location from the outskirts of the neighborhood right to 3rd and Gerald into a refurbished brick building that had been boarded up for half a decade. The building's nice, but what's more impressive is the determination of 275 local high school students who voluntarily spend several evenings a week being tutored, nurtured, cajoled even, by a dedicated staff and an army of volunteers. Everybody please link up with circle time. Um, can you guys circle up? Let's go. They start and end every session with a unity circle that's filled with announcements and appreciations. This evening, it's led by site director Omar Butler. All right, so when everyone is quiet, we can get started. All right, so um, welcome. I'm glad everyone is here. Um, I hope you all uh, had a great weekend. Um, My name is Omar Butler, and I'm site director of College Track San Francisco. I grew up uh, not too far away from here, um, up uh, in the housing projects up in Hunters Point. Um, I caught the bus that went past this building every day. Um, I was the first in my family to graduate from college, and so my story resembles a lot of the stories that um, of the kids that we serve. This is probably the halfway point in the semester. It's important to keep plugging through um, for the remainder two months of the semester. So Sean, you can lead us off. A lot of you just finished up your first grading period, so please bring those report cards in. That's the only way we can know how to support you guys. So once we know what you need extra support around and what we can do for you, then we can help sit down and make a plan or just get the tutors to make sure they're looking out for you. So please bring those in. Folks will say, you need that in San Francisco? Isn't that the home of you know the financial district and the tech boom? They don't know that in the shadows of those things lies this community you know, that wants it, wants to be involved in all that growth and development, but to this point has been ignored. I think the biggest misconception about the neighborhood is, I mean, embodied with these kids, that folks don't want better, that folks don't want to participate, that folks don't want to live in safe neighborhoods and safe communities, that folks don't want good schools. I think that there isn't an achievement gap, there's an opportunity gap. And so I think one of the things that College Track says is, you give these kids the opportunities, they will make the best of them. My name is Elisa Harrison. I go to Gateway High School. I'm a junior. I heard about College Track when I was in seventh or eighth grade. I think it was eighth grade. Omar came to where I went to middle school at, and he talked about it. I grew up here in Bayview Hunters Point. The neighborhood, I don't really know how to explain it. It's like you get a lot of different vibes from, I feel like from every corner you hit. If you go down that way to 3rd and Palu, 
you see a lot of drunks, you see a lot of people that's on drugs, you get used to seeing that. So it doesn't bother me. And if you go further down to Cusada over there, you see a lot of young kids hanging out on the corner. And like you go to school with these kids, you grow up with them, and like they just grow up to be another person that's down on third, drunk, or on drugs. And like, it just, I don't want that. If I was just going to school, college really wouldn't even be something I thought of on a daily basis. But I went on a lot of college tours through College Track. I got to visit Howard University. That's my top choice right now. When I went there, I just felt like I should be here. All right, let's end. Good. Let's try a little faster. One, two, three. Any youth development organization should take into account all the needs of the young people, not just the scholastic needs, but the cultural needs, the artistic needs. We've had art, you know, we've had poetry and drumming, we've had yoga. I think that our ultimate goal is to have our students be well-rounded. And so the connection a drumming class has to a college access program is that one, it exposes our kids to the arts. I think this is something that kids from Bayview miss out on that opportunity. Um, I think it builds culture for us, that this just isn't an environment where you need to sit down and put your face in a book. But I can still remember that pain of those tendrils eating up the flesh of my chest, the heat almost pushing into my body, skin melting and mixing with dribbles of marshmallow. It also Fire. gives our students an outlet for their creative juices to flow. All right, so a couple of appreciations before final announcement. Go back and circle. Gabby. I want to appreciate Carlos for helping me with an application. Anybody else? Shout out to everybody in the tutoring room today. Everybody was working really hard. And I also want to um, just appreciate everyone who had a plan today because that's the name of the game this week. So anybody. The Omega Boys Club everybody? actually helped me. Anybody? Um, an organization founded under the same principles to get students from this community out of the hood and into college. And so 25 years later, I'm helping kids go to college. I would have never thought that or guessed that. Um, I have people who I grew up with who have sons in the program. Um, and so it's, 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 it's an awesome feeling. I think that I still don't understand it in totality. Anybody else? Hold on, wait. Wait, 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 wait. I'm hearing way too much side conversations. Most of the people I grew up with can't afford to live in Bayview or San Francisco. You know, we lose kids throughout the year, kids who have to move um, to the East Bay, you know, out to the Central Valley because it is cheaper and it's more affordable. Um, I live in Redwood City. Um, I wish I could afford to move back to Bayview. It's a neighborhood I grew up in. Um, I think it would mean a lot, even more, to the kids. Um, you know, I think that so oftentimes they hear about, you know, do well and get out. You know, and there's more people they can see that are still here, that value and see this community for its assets. They would begin to appreciate that as well. I've always said that if I do decide to leave, that I've all, I like, I want to come back and contribute to my community because Having programs like this is helpful because I know a lot of kids grow up seeing the same stuff like I do. And we would either be on the street or like in jail if we weren't here. So. Anybody else? That's it. Have a good night and we'll see you tomorrow. Around the same time that the college track site opened its doors in 2012, Third and Gerald got another new resident, all good pizza. This is not your typical pizza joint. It's mostly outdoors and surrounded by a chain link fence decorated with colorful nutrition themed art and Bayview centric murals. Inside the gates, it's a cross between a beer garden and a food truck park. Like most days, there are small clusters of folks, mostly workers from nearby businesses, lunching al fresco. They're sitting at reclaimed wooden tables amidst succulents and knickknacks. In the center of the lot is a permanently parked trailer emblazoned with All Goods' motto, where a little bit Iowa, a little bit Louisiana, and a whole lot of Bayview. 
Inside the trailer, they make pizzas, paninis, and salads with all organic ingredients. And that's where I find the owners, Kristen Trahan, who's lived in the neighborhood for 14 years, and her husband, Matt. Good afternoon, all good pizza. My name's Kristen Trahan, and together with my husband, Matt, we own All Good Pizza. We are on the corner of 3rd and Gerald. When people ask, you know, where do you live or where's your business, and I say Bayview Hunters Point, they go, ooh, you know. That, but there's such a stigma attached to the, to the neighborhood that, that it's unsafe or scary or, you know, that, that it's, it's not. It's loud. It's, there's sirens going all over the place. There's people yelling and hollering and yeah, it, it, it is rough, you know, but I don't ever worry about anything. And um, I've, I've been living here for four years. You been for pickup? JP. Hey. JP, no key. Would you care for anything to drink? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. It's 816, please. It's no mystery that we're a white couple in a predominantly black neighborhood. And it's, it's, not a, it's not a thought in either of our heads until something happens where we realize that there's a lot of history here and there's a lot of people that, that their parents and grandparents you know, grew up here. And the Navy shipyards was active and we're still newbies. Babe, did you order produce? Not yet. We should probably order a couple of cases of the organic Lassonado Dino Kale. Get two, two cases. cases of that. Get uh, four cases of organic arugula. Uh, fennel. 12 count fennel, 12, 12 count radicchio. Yes. That should be good. And we got plenty of basil. We, we knew that we wanted to do something out of a, a truck or trailer or whatever. Not a big fancy restaurant that we would have to dump two, three million dollars into to, to get going and we came across this trailer on Craigslist. Purchased it before we even had a place to park it. We just knew that we were going for it. And we have a friend, uh, Antoine, who actually lives on Gerald, and uh, he's in real estate. And he said, hey, what about this lot on, uh, across from KFC? Got a hold of the owners. We said, hey, just are you, you know, into giving us a lease? And they did. And um, when we first got the lot, it had been uh, vacant for about 12 years, 10 to 12 years. And there was graffiti everywhere. There were people living in there. It was boarded up, chained up. It was just, it was an eyesore. I mean, we literally hauled off 16,000 pounds of garbage uh, off of the lot just to get it cleaned and ready to even occupy it. I mean, between grass and weeds and trash. I mean, it was everything from needles to garbage bags full of uh, stuffed animals. Hi, we're right with you guys. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good morning. So when we first opened up, when we opened the doors, I mean, we literally had the trailer and six or eight tables off of Craigslist. I think they were probably free. A couple planters lining the fence and uh, we opened up the doors and honestly, the first day was, uh, it was insane. A lot of people were looking forward to it because they'd been they'd saw us cleaning this lot for you know six weeks or so and everybody's wondering what's going on what's going on and the best part about it was people coming in like what's kale you know and we're like well it's you know this is kale and this is the way it's supposed to taste and this is what it does to your body and this is the vitamins that you get out of it okay two kale salads and a margarita pizza yeah, everybody was skeptical of course you know you don't have a kale salad in the bay of you but we do, and it makes you feel different than KFC. We actually ate there quite a bit as we were starting up because it's the only thing around here. You know, there's nothing here. It's a, it's a desert. I mean, we don't have a grocery store. There's no produce, which is crazy because we have the main hub of all produce that comes into San Francisco is on Gerald Street in walking distance, but they don't, they take them from the Bayview and just ship them out. People that live here in the community that really want good produce go elsewhere. The, the closest Whole Foods is Petrel Hill. I mean, that's three or four bus rides away if you're not in a car or, or, a, or a 35, 40 minute T-train ride and then a bus ride. It's horrible. It's, it, it's, it's sad is what it is. It's really sad. 
My name is Sean Moore. I grew up in Bayview Hunters Point, around the corner. And I do soap art at All Good Pizza. He actually creates sculptures out of soap. I like that. Wow, that's nice clean work there, I like that. Yeah. Right. But these, seriously, if you could make a bunch of those as fridge magnets, people would buy those. How do I know I'm an artist? My hands tell me I'm an artist. Sean's here working on his craft every day from about 10 to 3 p.m. So I'm like, you know, the uh, on-site artist. <laughs> he uh, doesn't really have a place to store stuff, so we, we keep it keep it stored away for him in the, in the shipping container and stuff, keep it dry. I stay at Mama Brown's. It's a shelter. He's become good friends, and uh, he's just a good guy. He helps out around you know, the place, and he's happy to have a place to do his art. Like this past weekend, they was closed for like, what, four to five days. And I was like, damn, I can't do my art, so. What kind of soap do you use? Jergens. Jergens? Yeah. Not the best? No, it's the cheapest. <laughs> 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 but, uh, like, all, the, all this is San Quentin soap. See, this is the soap we used to get. When, you, when you're incarcerated, generally you try to do something to pass the time or do something artistic that you can sell to make you some money. So I would make chess pieces and then uh, sell them. Do you ever do customized ones? You know, it all depends on the person. If I size them up and I feel they're going to be real picky and technical and everything, I won't even get into that. Basically, uh, I do this for me. I don't do this for nobody else. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna do the uh, Cuban. Uh, can I get the um, the turkey pesto panini? And that's for here? Uh, yeah. And a name for that order? My name is Aaron Avery. I'm sitting at All Good Pizza, having a panini that costs $7.50 which is cheaper than across the street at the local liquor store. I'm in the tech world, and a bunch of uh, us tech entrepreneurs moved out here and got a house together so we could create an incubation lab and have a backyard that we could go hang out and have a, a, a log cabin and a fire pit in. I lived in the neighborhood for about two years. I started in, in Soma and then went to Mission Bay. And then as that started building up, I was kind of trying to get out of the high rises and into the backyards. Bayview is a great community. It's very diverse. It has a lot of different cultures that are on top of each other, but they all seem to get along very well. Um, it's, it's, it's inspiring because when you get caught up in the tech culture, you, um, you lose sight of what really is important and here you know the other day if you go to the rose house down the street there's uh three days a week they have tables out there and they're giving food to um underprivileged and, and families that can't afford food and then you can walk one two blocks down the road here and you can be at all good pizza and there's just a really good sense of community having condos on the corner of third and gerald is probably not very far off it's just I don't want it to change too much I don't want I don't want there to be a bunch of people rich people coming in here buying up the houses redoing them and turning it into Malibu or make it look like somewhere some something that's completely different I would love the neighborhood to stay exactly the way it is and just progress with all the same people here with all the same businesses I just don't want it to lose its character While much of San Francisco becomes unaffordable, Bayview is a place where prices are steep, but not totally insane. But it's changing fast. Many in the area were surprised when a two-unit Victorian next to college track sold for exactly a million dollars. And nearby, places are listing for even more. Many of the folks who live and work around Third and Gerald welcome the change. They think the neighborhood has been neglected and underserved for years. Sure, there's a bit of nervousness about getting priced out, but there's also an excitement about Bayview becoming a better place to live. As we've seen in the rest of the city, tomorrow could be different. This neighborhood could be developed beyond recognition. 
15 years ago, when I left San Francisco, the corner of 3rd and King was just warehouses and a few dance clubs. Now, it's one of the most expensive spots in the city. 15 years from now, it's hard to say what the intersection of 3rd and Gerald will look like. But one thing is certain, it will be different. Thanks for listening to what became the prototype for The Intersection. This story ran on KLW's Cross Currents in May of 2014. Since then, Bayview got a grocery store, a craft brewery, a distillery, a high-end bakery, and a cafe, with more to come. It's still one of the most affordable neighborhoods in San Francisco, but it's all relative. Plenty of homes now sell for over a million, and the median rent for a one-bedroom is over $2,500. Next week, we go back to what was a tipping point at the corner of Hayes and Octavia in Hayes Valley, the closing of Marlena's. This legendary drag bar and neighborhood watering hole ended its 23-year run in February of 2013, and the story of its final days is an intensely close-up portrait of change. Join me next week for Closing Time at Marlena's. Until then, I'm David Boyer, and this is The Intersection. Say hello and say goodbye to one of my favorite persons, Miss Marlowe.